It really is a pleasure being among you tonight. And um, not only among physicians and cardiologists, etc., but among friends, because I had friends and I made quite a few new friends actually tonight on this trip. So look forward to continued relation on a personal note, but certainly on a, on a professional note. And I'm really grateful for Houston Methodist and the Baker Heart Center to put this small and team, I would say, get together to talk give you a, at least a feel of mine of where cardiovascular imaging is going, but most importantly, to give you also a forum for us that we can discuss. And I'm, I'm also very pleased of uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, you know, Cardiac Society and uh, Wael uh, Al Mahmid being with us here, obviously a very known figure uh, in cardiology and our friendship and our collaboration has gone many years from the ACC times and CDR, so many other things, but tonight is a little different flavor. Tonight we will be talking about imaging and how important that is and what the future looks like. So you don't need to, you don't need to take notes tonight because there aren't too many data slides. I want to just imagine, feel of how important imaging is to you in your practice. And I presume most of you are, cardio how many of you are cardiologists? How many are internists or GP? Others, surgeons maybe, I don't know. Surgeons maybe, yeah, here you go. And others maybe, I don't know what, what others, you know, maybe anesthesiologists, it's radiologists, here you go. Radiologists is important. <laughs> so uh, I think no matter what you are doing, no matter what you're doing, and actually nowadays, imaging is an integral part of what you do. I just, uh, finished reviewing the COCATS, meaning training for the United States. And there are, you know, 12 task forces and four of them, are, five of them are about imaging one way or another, how you train physicians going, because as you know, things have evolved over time. I have to disclose that I have a relationship with GE regarding a licensing agreement. And what I wanted to give you a feel, if you have not been to, uh, to the States, how many have you been to the States one way or another at some point in time? Well, well, you have a personal invitation. How about that? This is the Texas Medical Center. And uh, the Texas Medical Center, believe it or not, is the largest in the world of conglomerate of institutions looking at healthcare in general. But believe it or not, what put this on the map is cardiovascular disease from Dr. DeBakey's days. And Dr. DeBakey had Michael DeBakey, originally Lebanese, you may know that, um, uh, came actually and did a lot of collaboration, particularly in Saudi Arabia, but this part of the world. And uh, this is uh, our institution here. This is Methodist Hospital. This is downtown Houston, believe it or not. Houston is like 4 million people. And medical center alone employs 100,000 people. And it is an amazing medical center because you have uh, two medical schools within it. You have University of Texas healthcare system. You have MD Anderson for cancer care, Methodist Hospital, which has basically all areas of medicine, but I think uh, cardiovascular disease is, is rather big. And this is the uh, Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center and, and others, a lot of uh, activity there overseeing Rice University. Right? You probably heard about Rice University. It's just we do a lot of collaboration with them also. For those of you who have a more gray hair than others or less hair, you know, you've seen the growth of what we're talking about because most of it really has occurred from an impact point of view, not from a development of technology over the past 10 years. I think quite a bit of that impact, and if you say even more impact over the past five years. And, uh, you know, all of us started somewhere between this methodology, which is still important. Why is it important? Because tells us about acuteness of an event, conductivity of an event, but all the others tell us something about structure and function of the heart, one way or another. And uh, we know this, ultrasound, we know nuclear, CT and MRI certainly are the, the big newer ones. And, and why the important, as you know very well, is at least from a CT point of view, that's for the first time that you could see the arteries non-invasively with a decent resolution. And the latest technology, as you know, is from one of the vendors to have a time resolution of 67 milliseconds. 
I mean, you gotta be fast enough because the heart is moving. So, and if you don't have that, you have blurry images and you may not be able to see well, you may overestimate, you know, stenosis size, artifacts, and so many other things. And that's why I would say that it really has matured over the past five years. MRI is very unique, as you know very well, in what? In imaging a myocardial infarction, we have all the others tell us something one way or another indirectly. But if you want to tell me what is the size of an infarction, not indirectly by CK or troponin, what is the size, location, and everything else, MRI is really the technology nowadays with gadolinium. And this is our team. You know probably some of them through publications. This is Dr. Mike Quinones, who was, believe it or not, my mentor. I've been at Methodist uh, since 1980. I did not want to leave anywhere else because I firmly believe that if you have a team that you work well together, that you actually you build on that team and, uh, and you're the most productive and most effective one way or another. Uh, Dr. Naga, Sharif Naga, you could tell where, you know, uh, our friend here from Egypt, you know, he's, he's from Egyptian origin. And let me tell you, he's, he's probably the diastology guru in our field and certainly has, you know, written the guidelines for diastolic function. We've written, and still, this is Dr. Little, Dr. Mamarian. You've probably seen many of the nuclear uh, publications from, be it EBCT, or, and this is Dr. Deepan Shah, who directs cardiac MRI. So the message here is that we've developed over the past 10 years now a unique situation in the States, and it's still maybe unique here, unique situation where I went to the administration, I said, this is my vision. And my vision is to put together all these imaging modalities, all the heads of imaging modalities together, as opposed to radiology, cardiology, Ecolab being in one place, nuclear being another one, MRI down in the basement. And the reason for it is then you have a team that looks for the betterment of patient care in many ways. One, all of them are co-located, so that's how you design something futuristic. It's hard to do it now, but if you design something, all of them are co-located, so patients come in, and you know all the choices are there. If they go for the wrong test, quote unquote, at times, can move them into another. It's great for training of any fellows, students, and everything else. Why? Because believe it or not, we sit in one room. It's U-shaped almost, right? And we interpret various things. So the fellows are exposed to echo, nuclear, CT, whatever it is. All the faculties together, I used to not see them. Um, now we see them much more. The fellows are there. And from a research point of view, let me tell you, you're gonna be the most productive. And the reason for it, you have an idea, somebody is across, you know, you talk it over. And I think, uh, and most of our imaging even didactics have changed. We used to have an echo conference, a nuclear conference. It's actually imaging conference of how do you, how do you look at a disease and see, well, that's the pro and con of looking at it from this technology versus that other technology. And I think you will see that in the new guidelines for COCATS that it's pushing for imaging as opposed to this technique versus this other. Imaging will touch, and I know it touches every portion of cardiovascular disease. You name it, basically it's all healthcare. And, and I would say, and many people would say, that you're not a cardiologist, and sorry for the radiologist, but you're not a cardiologist unless you know something about imaging. Be it heart failure, be it an intervention, whatever it is, those tools are almost everywhere. And if it is too foreign to you, I think it's detrimental for you. Because you're, I'm not saying that you're gonna be an expert at it, but you need to understand it and learn the language. And believe it or not, some of our surgeons like Dr. Lowry and the others who specialize in mitral valve repair know about echo Doppler as much as I know. And why? Because we tag along. I call him for things and he calls me for things and we share that information. So this is, this is important to speak the common language. And I think, and as much as I need to know, I don't need to know a stent down to what the size of a stent, but at least I need to know the big things. And I think everybody of us needs to know that. Now, if we take ultrasound, uh, the story is amazing. You could map the same thing as the story is the same principle of a piezoelectric crystal that you send and little ultrasound waves come back and bounce them back. 
started from little A mode, et cetera, in 1950. And we're all the way there to 2013 and beyond. The principle is exactly the same. It hasn't changed over time. And there were two different questions that happened. One is, I want to see how, how strong is the signal coming back. So that's imaging, including 3D, where technology has improved. And the other one was, if I sent a certain frequency and came back and came back at a different frequency, this is Doppler, what's the velocity, what's everything else? And from there, you have all these beauties. You have strain imaging, you have all this that tells us so many other things, and, and that's exactly the same. So you have a family of, of tools at your disposal to answer some fundamental questions. Ventricular function, valvular heart disease, you name it. So what are the trends? I mean, if you look into the future, where, where are people going in this field beyond development the technology? One is you will see, and I've just seen actually something out of, out of Duke University, uh, is an incredibly fast ultrasound, I mean, down to, you're talking milliseconds. And, uh, and you will see that hopefully penetrating into 3D because 3D nowadays gives us tremendous information in 3D, but it's still limited in its temporal and even spatial resolution, right? It's not like I'm going to drop 2D and the others, no. And the reason for it, they have better, you know, resolution. Uh, you're going to see automation. And you haven't seen that as much in ultrasound. You've seen more automation in CT, but you're going to see much more of that. So I acquire the images, cuts up, spliced, Whatever it is, quantitate it, come back to you. And I think you will see more of that. Miniaturization is, is probably unique to all the imaging modalities. Uh, I'll show you something later on of what, what could be developed that you put right here in your pocket. And it's really amazing, as opposed to all the others. The others, you know, not that as portable. And multimodality integration. So... This is 3D. This is not, not new anymore. I think I'm pretty sure you have quite a few of the 3D equipments one way or another. Uh, but it is high volume rate. So what you're going to see is less concern about, so instead of frame rate, you talk about volume rate of this heart and how fast are you seeing. Now, you've seen this uh, is, is strain imaging that, for those of you who are not familiar with that, is instead of getting an M mode and looking at thickening of the heart, now I can look at thickening of the heart even from any window. This is all automated. I don't have to trace anything. And uh, this heart is shortening and then lengthening, right? You can see it shortening and lengthening, and this is all displayed at various regions of the heart. You could quantitate it, and there's data now telling us about longitudinal strain. Global is even better than ejection fraction, at least complementary, more quantitative. Take a look at this heart that is uh, almost dyskinetic here, and the only segment that is still decently working at the, is at the base of this heart. You could take it there. Heart is shortening. This is the good segment. All the others are bad, almost flat, nothing. And this apex is the one that is dyskinetic. And all that is fully automated. Fully automated. So it gives you some quantitation one way or another. And then you can come up with map. This is 3D. So 3D application of strain. In the past, remember, if you look at 2D alone, right, and most of the other methodologies, if you track this 2D slice and you see the heart contracting from one place to another, right, it's not in the same plane. The heart is moving, right? So, but with 3D technology, you could actually track each speckle, where is it going? From diastole to systole, certainly much more accurate. And I think this is the big thing. You can look at torsion of the heart, see this heart torsion, apex, and, and these have not yet been applied well as to what I would take now. But you know that strain is very important nowadays, and when you have a cancer center, people are going to knock on your door and say, well, it's not, I'm not waiting for the ejection fraction to come down from cardiotoxicity. I want an, a more sensitive parameter, which is a reduction in strain. Okay, and this is, this is what you're looking at. A much more sensitive 
uh, you know, parameter. Obviously, you could quantitate and automate most everything else regarding that, and I think uh, this is where, where the future is going. So I'm going to jump to heart failure, okay, and think a little bit about what are we doing currently in heart failure. Well, imaging is, is crucial because all of them are going to have uh, you know, shortness of breath and maybe edema. And what can imaging help you? Imaging, can, you can infer at times what the etiology is. We know what the etiology of this hypertrophy is like. This may be ischemic or, or dilated cardiomyopathy, but most likely dilated here. You know most likely what's going on here. At least it gives you three differential diagnoses that you know offhand. It could be infiltrative, which is amyloid here, or you know, end-stage hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or hypertension. And you use a few tricks to figure out what it is, but it certainly narrows down your diagnosis as opposed to somebody who has tremendous regional abnormalities and, and see what the differences are, uh, including a Takotsubo syndrome. So even imaging can tell you a lot about differential diagnosis and what goes on. And we talked about already that get MRI with gadolinium, and hopefully we'll find another agent that we could use in individuals who have some renal dysfunction. But that's the only technology really that can identify where myocardial infarction is and in the key area of myocarditis, which has been in the past really underdiagnosed. Because let me tell you what the scenario is. Somebody comes in with some chest discomfort, troponin is elevated, you cath them and the coronaries are normal. And the first answer is recanalized, right? And, but at times, actually not infrequently, we'll do an MRI in those situations and find out that the pattern of uptake is not in a coronary distribution. So I think that's a tool that really can help you because instead of being too aggressive about treating coronary disease that never existed, you're treating a different disease. And we don't know whether we can treat it at this stage of the game. But at least it gives you better feel. Now, I said about Dr. Nagh being, you know, uh, a pioneer in diastology. I think everybody nowadays uses an E over E prime ratio or E over A ratio to predict diastolic function. This is actually came out, you know, I don't know how many years ago. It's been, it's been a while nowadays, 1997. But, uh, but we know when you use tissue Doppler that currently, I mean, you're so simplistic anyway. I don't know how it does even work. Why? Because I look at an annulus, you know, here, here, have an idea of relaxation. I extrapolate to the whole heart and think that, you know, I, I know diastolic function about this heart. It works most of the time, but in certain situations it doesn't work. And what was, will be happening hopefully in the near future is something like this, where you have vectors actually for systole and diastole, uh, tissue velocity as well as tissue strain that occur at every region. So no, I'm not only extrapolating from one area, actually I can take a look at all relaxation of the heart. And instead of extrapolating from one area or another, come up with a much better understanding of how good relaxation is and maybe come up with different algorithms for trying to help us from a diastology point of view. So you could see where that could help us going in the future. There's no question about it. MRI, do you have, do you have MRI? Do you use it here, cardiac? Anybody? Start, start, Starting. Start. You will be amazed. Let me tell you, you'll be amazed. Our program started six years ago. We had the same machine, okay? No offense to radiologists, but our radiologist was not interested, right? So it's the same machine, just tells you. Same machine. We had 33 cases per year, okay? And let me tell you, once I refer one time, I'll never refer it again. And the reason for it, the images were horrible, right? Not informative. You try, you stop. <laughs> you hire somebody, Dr. Shah, specialized two years in cardiac MRI, trained under the best, Dr. Ray Kim at that time, okay? And not same machine early on. Within three years, from 33 volume to 2,000 per year. It's not over it's the same physicians. It just the images are just like out of this world and used appropriately.
I'll give you an example. Myocarditis is one. Two, bicuspid aortic valve with an aortopathy, right? Uh, why would I get an echocardiogram and a CT and MRI to follow these people? Why would I get one test that tells me everything I need to know? It's cost effective. It's really the way to go. So you're going to have to use your mind, if you have the technology, as to how best to utilize it, right? And if you're looking for somebody with ischemic cardiomyopathy, what's, you know, what's the ischemic burden? Uh, nowadays, you could do stress. So you can get stress MRI in addition to late gadolinium. So I know the residual ischemia that is in this individual, how much scar they have, and decide in the high-risk individual in heart failure, who do you transplant, who do you send LVAD, who? You see what I mean? It helps you tremendously in your diagnostic approach. And these are some examples. So it's not to replace <laughs> an echocardiogram or a regular stress test. It is to use it when you need it because it's incredibly powerful. It really is incredibly powerful. And let me tell you, I was personally involved in, in most of these technologies to look at, at viability. You know, my academic career had many things, and one of them was viability. You know, from the basic sciences all the way, the butamine and nuclear and everything else. I don't send people anymore to a dobutamine echocardiogram to look at viability. No. Because somewhat, there is some danger in that. There's no question about it. But the information that I can get from an MRI far exceeds it. Far exceeds it. There's no question about it. So then, if you have this multiple modalities for you to choose from what is the best test for that particular patient and how do you use it, really that's the best way to do it. And having a collaborative kind of work in an environment, it's, not, it's no longer competitive just for me to push for a technology, it's for the push the right approach for a particular patient. And there are tremendous things nowadays you can fuse right? The images, so you, you can end up basically with a heart like this and uh, know where this car is on the 3D map of this heart. It's, it's amazing. It really is amazing what, what you could see nowadays and everything else we had was really inferred. Now, that's what we use here. I don't know how many, uh, uh, for stress testing, what do you guys use? Echo or nuclear? Both. Both? Yes. That's, that's pretty much universal. Well, we recognize that we have these issues. And I think, you know, I'm involved in both. And, you know, one thing I, I quieted the other zealous people around me and said, you know, stop tooting your horn and, and tell me some of the goods and bads of each technology because people need to know. And that's how we teach our fellows. Well, the left bundle branch block, let me tell you, if I'm, I'm looking for coronary disease, yes, you could do stress testing. But if I want to know really the anatomy of somebody, particularly the ventricular function is going down, these technologies may not help me as well. At times, you need the anatomy. At times, you need the anatomy. In women, we, we used to have, this is lesser of a problem with gating nowadays. Inferior wall, you need to know that inferior wall is a problem for any methodology. Attenuation for nuclear, less contraction for the inferior wall. It's an overcall at times, undercall, depending how, how, do, you, how do you interpret, right? Uh, hypertrophy, false, false negative when you have a DSE, if you're doing the butamine stress echo because of the hypertrophy, false positive for stress nuclear. Three vessel disease, well, you can have a e flat EF response with a, on an echocardiogram and this is under-recognized by nuclear cardiologists. I don't know how many of you, but balanced ischemia, meaning triple vessel disease, calling it normal, is not too infrequent. It's not very high, but not too infrequent. So, so have somebody with two to three millimeter ST depression on a stress test and have a normal nuclear, you'd better be careful of what you're missing, right? Or somebody with continued angina, et cetera. Hypertensive response, obviously, echo will have a, during an exercise, echo will have a problem. So, yes, we do them the vast majority of the time. You could even, once you have MRI, you could do some of that in case you want to do it. But we have issues at times that we need to know, and I think this is where CT comes on board.
uh, Tsahudi Hart, just before I came, we had, a, we had a session, a debate session as to anatomy versus physiology in coronary disease. Okay? And I think there was consensus that CT is very powerful, but its appropriate use is really best if you're aiming for the medium to low probability. If you have very high probability of disease, somebody with angina, almost two vessel, three vessel disease, there's really no point. Just go for a heart catheterization because otherwise they're gonna get a double information with the double whatever it is that we're concerned about, right? So you wanna try to as much exclude disease and the reason for it, their negative predictive value is very high. Positive predictive value for ischemia is low. Right? Because I see a lesion, I go back to square one. Is it significant? And that's why you do stress testing, right? So it's, it's very important from an appropriate utilization. You have to think about the likelihood of disease in a particular individual. At least take that into account when you come up with these diagnoses. I'll share with you something, another thought, okay? We're looking at this spectrum of disease from mild, right, all the way to very high. Stress testing, EKG, less sensitive, but stress echo and nuclear are somewhere here. They're going to detect practically, practically greater than 70% stenosis. Between you and I, you can forget about the 50 to 70%. Your detection rate is very low there. Not as good. So bottom line is, I'm looking at detection of significant disease trying to understand the functional significance of the disease. If I'm looking at here, I need another technology. And why would I look here? Because if you're Nushin, right, you're concentrated on prevention. Yeah, I understand she treats heart failure too. That's quite far, <laughs> right? But if you're into prevention, you want to know what's the earliest of the disease. You're not going to go for catheterization. You're not gonna go for a CTA, but conceivably you could go for a calcium score, right? But that's, the, that's one of the earliest technologies that we could use that. And let me show you the power of that. So, I don't know, if, do you use calcium scoring here? You do? Before, I know before, but do you use it alone? <laughs> here you go, see? <laughs> yeah, we use it alone. Huh? You have to put it in the guidelines clearly as a class one indication. Well, it's getting there, it's getting there. <laughs> I mean, it's so slowly creeping, it's amazing. It's creeping. <laughs> it's creeping. But I think it's, it's really the best diagnostic. Now, are you going to do it? Are you going to do it irrespective of what the clinical situation is? No. Right? If somebody has risk, you're going to address the risk one, two, three, four, whatever it is. And if it's not going to change your approach, you're not going to do it. Right? You would do it. Now in the new guidelines, it came in a way, right, of the cholesterol guidelines. If you're borderline in treating, or if you have strong family history that you can't pinpoint, right, something like this, calcium score came out. So we hope that appropriate use criteria and others will be a class one indication, right? But this tells you, said, if you have a lot of burden of disease, but, but, you're not yet ischemic from them. It impacts your prognosis differently, right? So this is a, a select population that had normal stress nuclear. So they didn't have any ischemia. So they had some burden of disease. And the higher their score, calcium score, some of them had more even than 400, the higher the calcium score, the worse their events, you know, down the line. And we're talking about years here. It's not, you know, the second year, but you know, they're gonna have some events because they have some burden of disease. There's no question about it. Something will happen down the line. And vascular, we use from time to time. I mean, it's not as well integrated with our overall approach, but I would think that at some point in time, if we really wanna think about risk of an individual, and it's not only any more risk of acute myocardial infarction, you have to look at the whole patient, right? If you're looking at your own self, you wanna think about Total risk, <laughs> right? Total risk. And the total risk are your clinical risk factors. Everybody knows who they are. The cardiac phenotype at some point in time, 
coronary calcifications, whether there's hypertrophy, yes or no, function, exercise tolerance, believe it or not, still a major indicator, right? Ischemia, and if there's atherosclerosis somewhere else. And this is your total cardiovascular risk one way or another, right? Now, people in the past, adding to this, this is still a major one looking at down the line. I mean, this, this is your building block because it's incredibly strong. And then imaging obviously helps you as you go along if you have that. And you could differentiate somebody with hypertrophy, with you know, controlled hypertension, with a lot of hypertrophy. So within those categories, certainly you could, uh, you could further risk stratify. So if we look at valvular heart disease, I think for valvular heart disease, even at this stage, the major player is ultrasound. It's still the major player for early diagnosis, early screening, uh, assessment of stenosis, regurgitation, still number one. And the reason for it is it has a good time resolution, tells you about hemodynamics more than any of the other imaging modalities that you know, we've talked about, except catheterization, obviously, right? So uh, it really is the big armamentarium for, and including transesophageal in case you need it. Now, we still have issues. I was asked to chair again the guidelines for, my, for regurgitation by ASE and CMR, okay? And if you tell me where is the problem, the problem is in regurgitant lesions, particularly mitral regurgitation. Among the cardiologists here, if I give you a couple of cases, we're gonna have much more heterogeneity than other cases of maybe stenosis or others. And it's not against you, that's life. <laughs> and, and we need something more robust. We need something more robust, more automated, less et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure the guidelines are gonna give that to you. I'm gonna give you a little more information. But I, I really think, and we're partnering now with some you know, physicists at the University of Houston to try maybe to give us a different way of looking at it. Because if you keep looking at the same issue, with the same pair of eyes, I don't think you're gonna see a different solution. So I'm hoping, but if you tell me where is the investment for the future, I think that's one to try to improve that because ultrasound is no longer a step towards a cardiac catheterization. Echocardiography nowadays is it. Diagnose bad disease, heart failure, whatever it is from mitral regurgitation, patient's gone for surgery. <laughs> So this, the onus is on your shoulder. There's no question about it for those of you who are involved in this. And what's, what's new and, and fun really coming up? Uh, obviously, you could take a look at these valves and look at, at strain. And I think one area that we are working with, I don't know, you're going to see some publications of that. It'll be interesting going forward, is with these tools, you can look at strain. This is the first in man a couple of years ago. In the past, for you to look at strain, meaning if I have this valve and it starts deforming every time there is systole, where is the deformation, most of it? Why? Because it puts stress on this, on this valve and that's why you have rupture of my uh, myxomatous valve, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the stress, believe it or not, as you can see it right here being developed, is at the commissures as well as the coaptation line. In the center of the valve is the least of the issues. And that's where you see actually most of the ruptures of the chordae tendini, et cetera. So when you repair a valve, you want to make sure that you're reducing stress. And I think that's what we're looking at here. So this is a stress map before surgery and after surgery. And you could see how much reduction in stress there is. Ultimately, you know, I'm dreaming about the future, what I'm going to do. I do hope that I could get a console, me and the surgeon, we can sit down, particular patient, take a picture with 3D, and then do a simulation of the surgery and what really happens to that valve. I reduce the annulus down, bring it down, I put artificial cordae. What happens to strain? Is there some other areas I need to address? Yes, no, before I go in there, conceivably. We could draw it for him if you want. But I really think, I mean, a priori knowing what the pathology is, and maybe what the surgical approach is would give us even a better look into the future as what could be done. Also, 
It may. We don't know. I mean, all this is hypothetical. Also, it may predict the patients that will do better after repair versus the others that, you know, may not do as well. You know, imagers nowadays are, you know, I don't know how, how many of you go to the cath lab and, and help the interventionists do things, you know? Uh, well, let me tell you, we are taxed a lot. You know, all the, most of the interventions nowadays need some imaging guidance. Now, TAVR procedures, we've gradually migrated toward transthoracic. We do, used to do TE. I know in Germany at times they do it even without anything. But at least we'll take a look and make sure that there's no significant aortic regurgitation. A mitral clip, it must. There's no question. And you, you got to be an astute, good echocardiographer. A left atrial occluder device, You'd better be there, right? Somebody got to be there. You know, septal puncture, fine. I mean, it could be anywhere, but nowadays, actually, it's probably safer with an intervention. So in another area, I don't know how many of you do those kind of things, you're interventionalists, but the patients that have a perivalvular leak, you know, you can put plugs there and, and stop the perivalvular leak, particularly if they are high risk. So, you know, all this, you have to be in, in the operating room and you could use an imaging, particularly for EP procedures between, you know, CT where you put the vein and dation uh, in relation to the, uh, where the scar is. And, uh, you know, we still have some issues now for aortic regurgitation after, after valves and, and uh, are, are the regurgitations, you know, significant that you see right here or no? Why? Because at times you have, you know, different areas. And it, it, it puts so much stress on the echocardiographer in the, in the uh, operating theater to, uh, is this significant regurgitation? Do I need to do, do I need to dilate this valve more? Yes, no. Hopefully this is less and less. Why? Because the newer designs are taking calcifications into, and they have a skirt so that hopefully we'll plug in some of these aortic regurgitation and we're seeing less of them uh, nowadays. Uh, there are some lingering questions regarding you know how how quantitative how is, is MRI helpful is it better than echo in those situations is it more quantitative can you do personalized catheters uh, and and for this we wanted to do a model so futuristically we have a model of the heart believe it or not and this model of the heart has a ventricle inside it an atrium here and we developed that at, at uh, our laboratory we have inflows like a pulmonary vein and uh, we have uh, also uh, windows, just like an echocardiogram, parasternal window, apical window. And uh, also the beauty of it, believe it or not, besides, and just imagine how, how long it takes to get echo compatible, because you have a lot of reverberations in there, is also MRI compatible. So you could put this in the MRI machine and then try to find out which one is better than the other. Uh, a simulator can simulate any pressures within the heart. Systole, diastole, mitral stenosis, aortic regurgitation, you name it. Aortic stenosis, you name it. And this is actually the design, and this is the actual thing inside the magnet, and it's echo compatible. So you do an experiment, you do this, and uh, this is the team. This is uh, Dr. Little, who directs our uh, model right here, and uh, this is Dr. Shah, the MRI specialist and engineers, etc to try to figure some of these out. So hopefully you will see more and more of this. So you could simulate mitral valve, prolapse, regurgitation. You could attach the papillary muscles there. It really, really is interesting. Why? Because we need something like this, you know, to push it. So this is normal valve, mitral valve prolapse on the right, and you could see them. You could see the regurgitation and quantitate it. Another thing, you probably heard about 3D printing, right? Have you heard about 3D printing? If you haven't heard, you need to hear about it because even it's even people can print cells nowadays. So I'm not printing cells here, but we're printing from a CT scan. Take a CT scan, and our famous radiologist right here. You have calcifications on the aortic valve, and you have areas less calcific. You have the aortic root that is less calcific. The printer will print will differentiate the amount of calcium versus normal tissue and will print you in a foam, just like you will see here. So you can have patient-specific printers 
So these are from the CT scan, sent to a 3D printer to give you an LV outflow tract as well as an aorta. And this is from the CT, and this is what the lumen printed is. And why would you do that? You do that because then now you understand much more physiology. You could actually do an intervention on the valve itself. And I'll show you, this is an actual patient here, an actual patient, and this is the 3D printed one. Not only they look alike, but they behave alike. And this is your Doppler. So actually we just you know, published this in Jack. And, and from there, you could actually look at various models. You could develop maybe better catheters, better valves, and conceivably down the line, patient-specific models, because at times, if the, if the anatomy is, is very abnormal, you could indeed develop patient-specific therapeutic maneuvers and, and therapeutic models. You know this gentleman, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you know, he injected a, a certain material there that nobody knows. No, we know what it is. <laughs> it's called Obamacare. And, uh, you know, I don't know what filters to the outside, outside the United States versus what is inside. If you talk to most physicians, actually most professional organizations, they're certainly for it. And the reason for it, it, it gets you closer to what should be done in a such a developed country, which is availability of healthcare, of insurance for all its people. And I think it's, it was an insurance reform more than anything else. But with it also came many good things, all right? You know, I don't know if there are insurance companies here, but obviously insurance companies just don't like this early on. But later on, they liked it. Why? Because you sell more insurance, right? So overall, not too bad, believe it or not. Major resistance against it, particularly from the Republicans, but, uh, but overall important. Now, what does it imply to you and, and uh, to you and to us? Imaging we, is crucial. There's no question, but cost effectiveness and value are becoming important. So I don't know how important it is for you guys, but for us in the United States, cost effectiveness and value were not on the radar screen 10 years ago. I can tell you that. Meaning, you do, you do more, you do more, fine, you do more, you do more. And now, there is a cost factor. Remember what value is, is, is quality divided by cost, okay? So the cost factor was not, was not in it. Uh, more emphasis on quality, outcomes, and performance measures. And if you look at the United States nowadays, American Heart Association, ACC, has a list of measures Believe it or not, they're adapted by the government, ultimately. That would say that you would do this and this and this for care of an acute myocardial infarction. You do this and this and this for somebody with heart failure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are adopted. And you are measured against them. Okay? And, you know, our NCDR, and I know well, is, is, is part of that, too, is, is looks at all these kind of things. Looking for value, appropriate use, you know about the appropriate use criteria, and that's because of that equation that changed. Comparative effectiveness, radiation concern, and if there was no radiation concern, the new CT methodology is that you could image nowadays at two millisievert, even sub millisievert, wouldn't be there. If there was an outcry for it, the machinery would, stay, would have stayed the same. And healthcare models, at least for us, are changing. And we're looking at integration of healthcare. I don't know how your healthcare is and how much integration. I know you have private and you have government, but you know you see more of that even in the private insurance and private healthcare. People are gobbling others. So I mean, we have at Methodist Hospital we have seven satellite hospitals that gradually are being integrated. So you have the same records, same everything, and uh, you know, and then you know we'll be ready for. <laughs> Some ceiling, you know, called in the past capitation, could be episodes of care, et cetera, et cetera. But things can change very fast, very fast, and at times may not be on the radar screen. Ten years ago, you know, if you look back, so what could happen in ten years? Ten years ago, 
actually, that was 10 years now, was not cloned, right? There was no 64, 128, 365, whatever it is, slicers, right? No real-time 3D echo, none of that. The media was antisocial. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there was no Facebook, none of this. Yesterday I was out to dinner and you know, some of the cousins here, you don't have a Facebook account? I said, no, <laughs> I don't have a Facebook account. I, said, mm, I don't know, where are you living? There was no iPhone, you know, camera phone, iPad. I mean, can you imagine now living without one? No way, right? Well, what does the whole, what does future hold? I mean, uh, you know, you could look online. Dr. Winters, who who uh, does you know our uh, education and is the editor for the De Baker Heart Journal, asked me to edit an issue for uh, the future of cardiovascular imaging. So I invite you to take a look at it. It's on the web, obviously. It's on Pe you know uh, uh, PubMed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But let me share with you a few things of where could things. I mean, I already did, but a few specifics. You know, technology, I mean, we've always dreamt that how can I do a 3D with, without just using one window? Believe it or not, this technology already exists just recently, meaning that I can, I can take different positions without a locator, a 3D locator. I can take different positions, image the heart from different positions, and come up with a 3D of the heart. Technology is already existing. So just imagine you combine all this and come up with a 3D. Now I can imagine, I know it's doable, the question is, is this a good business model? You can have a sheet of ultrasound crystals, you put on the chest, and you can get the whole heart because this is available nowadays. And it will take even the bending of whatever it is. I mean, all this is computer technology. So you could do 3D from that, there's no question about it. You know, in the pet world, I don't know if you do any pet, but in the pet word, there is a new agent coming out. And this new agent is called Fluperidaz. And the beauty of this agent, if it gets approved down the line, and it has a lot of promise, it has one-to-one -one relation with coronary flow. For those of you who are nuclear cardiology, there is a rollover phenomenon, meaning none of them really tell you one-to-one -one flow. They'll give you an estimation, and after about two times normal flow, it's the same uptake. And that's big. This is really big. Why? Because it takes away this balanced ischemia portion because each territory will have something different. And you look at true coronary flow reserve that you may not be able to see when you give an adenosine or agadenosine or exercise, et cetera, et cetera. And this is an image. Images are really beautiful. So just imagine, you know, I think, you know, we would know within two years, three years, whether this is really approvable. We already talked about submillisievert. Uh, you know, Siemens just came out with, uh, with such a thing. GE has their own, I mean, each one, you know, each one of the companies. And that's beautiful because you need competition to push the envelope. You need competition to push the envelope. Uh, can we detect, can we prognosticate an acute coronary syndrome. Yes, we know the burden of disease at times, but acute myocardial infarction occurs at a time where nobody can predict at this stage of the game. We can tell you you're at risk, but it's just like uh, telling me it's gonna rain in the next three months in Houston. Well, I know it's gonna rain at some point in time, but do I know which weekend I can take off and put it together? No. So hopefully we could do that at some point in time. And PET, maybe if you detect inflammation, and here you're seeing the inflammation in the aorta as well as in the coronary in people with acute coronary syndromes. Possible. We don't know yet for sure, but that's a possibility. And you know that imaging nowadays, you could image almost any sequence of the development of the plaque, etc. You know, I mean, you can label almost anything with molecular imaging, and you could label it. Digital revolution. My goodness, all right? Uh, this is not a mural in a, in a cathedral, right? Uh, you know what that is, right? So Apple, etc. And uh, at the same time, don't we have gadgets? How many apps do you have for health? We have tons of apps for health. How do we use them nowadays? You know, we don't use them efficiently, right? They, 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 don't, they don't come together to a point. You may not know about this, but there is an XPRIZE. 
of $15 million, $15 million put by Qualcomm to, to do what? To be able to diagnose 15 clinical entities on a smartphone. 15 clinical entities, 200 participants, meaning groups, not individuals, groups. They're going after it. So they're going to they're gonna be a lot of things. Now, aren't we, aren't we great in this field? Now, we know about all the technology, but what do I use now for diagnosing anything in heart ailment? When I go to the bedside, what do I do? Take a good history, hopefully. I mean, that's in the past, unfortunately, people are bypassing history, which is <laughs> the basic ground. Do a physical examination. We know how good that is, right? Well, we detect few things, but you know, we're probably 10% sensitive. Uh, but that's about it. And we start ordering things right and left and up and down. Well, I have a proposal for you. Uh, accuracy for diagnosis, let me tell you, th this is not good. And it is in the United States. And if you think that our British colleagues are much better, or Canadian colleagues, because they look at things differently, they have as bad as we are. So we're happy, but we're not that happy either. Uh, we have handheld systems. Uh, they're still good or not. I don't know if you use them. You know, you, you may use them. Uh, probably the V-Scan is, is the most uh, popular one as to putting it in, in the pocket. Uh, but depending on the situation, I can tell you in the United States now, you know, we use it some, but we don't use it as often. And the reason for it at this stage of the game, it will change at this stage of the game is it is not part of what you do. And the reason is if I use this for diagnostics, I'm taking three to four minutes, maybe extra replace and not not accounted for in my work, for reimbursement or whatever it is, and I'm taking away something that is accounted for. If I send somebody for an echocardiogram, there is accounting for that, there is resources for that. If I send them to a nuclear, a stress, a whatever. But if I'm using something at the bedside that helps me directly, it's not part of it. That equation will change, and you know how it changes, right? If you're capitated, if you're reimbursed per episode, then you look for the most effective way of doing things, right? So let me, let me dream with you tonight, okay? And this is my dream, all right? Having called an omniscope, something that gives me many things. And I'll share that with you here. You take a look. Let me see if you share my vision. It's something like a smartphone that I can put in my pocket. And uh, this omniscope... Uh, Ultimately, you know, with Bluetooth technology can detect, you know, heart rate and blood pressure and all these, but this is not where they, uh, I want this smartphone to still have auscultation. Why? Because auscultation is important. Auscultation is 3D technology. It's 3D, actually 4D because sound is 3D. It facilitates quickly what I do and I use it for my lungs, I use it for the abdomen. And, uh, you know, I want this actually to do a little more, maybe, uh, the traditional ultrasound. So I could take a look at an echocardiogram and uh, do the various things. Nowadays, uh, what, what's on, uh, available doesn't give Doppler, but I think we should, you know, get the various Doppler techniques. Nowadays, everything can be done. And how many of you listen to the carotids? And what's the efficiency of listening to the carotids? I think it's, it's quite worthless, I would say. But we do it. it. It's good to, you know, have a contact with the patient in different areas. And um, I think we could have a little electrodes in the back that, you know, could record an EKG. And if we don't know whether there is PVCs or atrial fibrillation or whatever it is, we'll be able to do that. And I think ultimately this, I'm not going to put a name of a patient. I'm not going to do and download everything. Everything should be wireless through the Wi-Fi gets uploaded in my electronic health record and it goes where it goes. Meaning I do an ultrasound of the heart, goes with the heart examination, I do something for the lung, it goes there, whatever it is. So that's my vision down the line. It's good to dream because you never know. It may happen. <laughs> now, it, it, I think it improves my, would improve my examination. Uh, 
I'm not going to sit down and do a full echocardiogram. I just want a peek as to what's going on so I can decide whether I treat this individual for heart failure, is this diastolic, is this systolic, uh, is this murmur, this and this, so I can start. And if I need more, obviously you send them to a full ultrasound examination. Uh, you know, obviously the adoption will be predicated on your healthcare system. So it's, it's a great tool, but, you know, are you investing the time? And I think time will tell, really. But it would be great for having something that you could go in rural area, periphery, bedside, wherever you are, to be able to do such a thing. And last but not least is the availability of anything portable. Anything that you could go and contact a patient with is tremendously important. Now, obviously, we'll screen the masses for many things. And I think you can screen them by a quick history, you know, quick questionnaire, whatever it is, and maybe a quick physical examination. Actually, American Society of Echocardiography has done that. Nowadays, they, they went to India. You may have not know about it. And this is actually the forum that they had, okay? And in that forum, they did, after a quick screen of whatever it is, they did a 1,000 focused handheld echo examination within two days. Just two days. They had so many volunteers flow in. And you could send all these images throughout the world, right? Throughout the world. There were interpreters in Europe, in the States, whatever in the world. 75 worldwide readers, nine sonographers. Just two days, you screened 1,000 individuals. Just imagine. Actually, they hit the Guinness world record to be able to do that. But the beauty of it is you could use this technology, wherever you are, to be able to have better diagnostics at the bedside as opposed to mentating and thinking and referring individuals uh, you know, to, to at times more expensive technology, but I think it improves our efficiency. And I don't think we have, we have out, I don't think we've outgrown yet the old fashioned way of how to do a bedside evaluation beyond our history and physical examination and stethoscope. And I'm, I'm really pushing for us to use some of these technologies for us to be more in sync with what we could do in population, individual, et cetera, et cetera, in addition to all the technologies that we have. So put it together. Imaging is, is everywhere, really, from high-end to handheld devices, detection of early disease, cardiovascular phenotype. This is the first time, actually, I mean, by imaging, you're going to be able to declare what the phenotype is if you know there is a genotype you know, higher likelihood, risk of disease, et cetera, et cetera. Possible use of imaging for novel drug development as well as surrogate to patient outcome. Novel technologies, however, ultimately need to demonstrate value. I mean, this is a new word. They need to demonstrate value. So any companies that are coming up with a new thing, one way or another, the value could be conceivably patient outcome, better diagnostic, et cetera, et cetera, but even better workflow for the physician, nurse assistant, whoever it is, right? Uh, on the physician end, since we are the ordering, and at times, I don't, I don't think in, in your country, but in our country, nurse practitioners can do orders, is we have to be conscious about, now I don't have two methodologies, I have four, <laughs> right? And I'm not gonna go sequence of one, two, three, four, and then maybe have our characterization at the same time. So we have to be conscious and, uh, of what to order and when and what's the most appropriate for a particular patient. And last but not least, identify best and cost-effective approaches to disease detection and management in this world. It, it is a new world. Digital, multimodality, value conscious. And indeed, imaging is at the heart of, uh, of really healthcare. And last but not least, I'd like to invite you if you, any of you are going to the ACC, you're going to ACC, here we go. Uh, just before the ACC, there will be a dinner looking at all imaging modalities by, by world experts. And Roberto Lang will be there. Uh, uh, Jim Min from New York, Cornell will be there. Uh, some of our faculty will be there. Certainly, I'll be there. And if you want to venture westward, and I know you have an advantage over so many other people, 
right? So many other people. Why? Because you have a direct flight to Houston, Texas. Believe it or not. You know, Emirates flies to Houston. I love that flight because, you know, I can sleep on the plane 14 hours, whatever it is. Um, and even if, if you live in Doha, then you have a direct flight, believe it or not, from Doha. It's, ama- it's really amazing to have a direct flight. So I would like to invite you to come October. We have a course on multimodality imaging, a lot of hands-on, and, uh, and also small groups. So we'll have a lot of patient cases, et cetera. And actually, we have uh, the mighty area, 40,000 square feet, pure for education. And in it, there's a lot of simulators. There are so many other things, and it's great to interact. We have a lot of people last year from the Netherlands, from South America, and would love to see some of you who are interested in imaging to come and just spend a few days, and I know we'll take care of you. So thank you for the opportunity to come and, and spend some time with you. Appreciate it.